It is my pleasure to, um, to begin the second half of our symposium here. And we, I want to welcome Harriet Hamasi, my colleague from Brown. And she will be talking about mobilizing academic libraries for, collect, uh, for collection action. And once again, I refer you to her biography on the back of the program. And Harriet. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this symposium. Um, when I came to Montreal, I thought, well, what kind of connections do I have here? And I have to be honest, I don't really have any connections to Montreal. But I do have a connection in Canada. My daughter is a faculty member, a new faculty member at University of Toronto. And she is one of those two faculty members uh, who benefits from the uh, music uh, and materials about music from Iran that Larry mentioned, so thank you, Larry, and University of Toronto. I also wanted to say that there's a small connection uh, between me and your provost. Uh, provost Massey uh, studied at Brown, got his PhD there, and our na names are just a little bit similar, in case you didn't notice. I don't think there's a Brown connection because of that, though. In this age of networked information, this age of digital technologies and social media, in this age of disruption, libraries and universities are repeatedly called on to address questions regarding their authority, their legitimacy, impact, relevance, adaptability, and their sustainability. We are called on to know to demonstrate, and to tell our truth. Our truth is knowledge, even as we sort out the continuities from the discontinuities of methods, forms, tools, and approaches to teaching, learning, and research. With our commonly held missions to discover, communicate, and preserve knowledge, while also contributing to the advancements of society, Universities and their libraries are called anew to revitalize the manner in which we fulfill our missions, specifically to revitalize the ways in which we stimulate, support, steward, and disseminate scholarship created by our faculty. Because the production of new knowledge lies at the heart of the university mission and increasingly at the center of libraries' expanding roles. It is critical that in addressing today's research questions, we ensure that the forms and methods we use both reflect and shape the emerging capabilities and realities of our time. Even as universities and their libraries, along with private funders and government agencies, increasingly support open access to all content, we recognize that universal accessibility is not the end of the story, but only its beginning. Broad scale access has helped integrate spatially dispersed knowledge communities, and it has extended and connected the boundaries of our libraries and our classrooms. As much as universal access has fostered a new culture of sharing, collaboration, and participation, it has also created a dependency and an unsettling reliance on a network made up of variously strangers, scholars, partners, predators, and endless models of commerce and trade. This network has profoundly changed the ways in which we communicate, conduct business, experience entertainment, and learn. Changes in social media have been accompanied by changes in what people say and how they say it. The ubiquity of screens has changed how we read and write. We merge words with moving images, creating books that we watch and televisions that we read. These changes have had impact outside the academy as well as within it. 
The network has helped change the nature of local library investments in collections and services. It is also reshaping how libraries coordinate with each other and with their providers, with their users, and with their universities. We are seeing similar transformations among universities in how they define, resource, and intermingle their campuses, their faculty and students, and their curricula. The rapid growth of information from ever diverse and frequently unknown, unreliable sources has sadly made this old, tired joke still true. It has caused many of us in today's libraries and classrooms to correctly emphasize skills in information access, evaluation, and analysis. These information skills have been taught at the expense of providing students, sometimes, in teaching broader literacy skills that help students learn how to use and reuse information, how to develop their intellectual and ethical expressions, and document their thoughts and questions through text as well as digital media. Basically, how to connect their technical, communication, visual, cultural, and hands-on skills with their scholarly tasks and their life's ambitions. But let's be honest, how can we teach our students if we have not taught ourselves to read, write, and think in this digital age? We are still catching up with the capabilities of our time. We have built new spaces, created new services, and hired or retrained staff with new areas of expertise. But what we can imagine and even begin often outweighs what we can truly deliver and support. Faculty need their libraries to once again become centers of scholarship, to become laboratories and communal workshops where they and their students can help, can learn and share tools, share ideas and skills where they can explore, experiment, iterate, and build all forms of scholarship, including those that incorporate computing, data modeling, multimedia, and prototyping. Faculty need to be free and allow their students to be free to express ideas and share work in a variety of ways that extend beyond the traditional written forms of scholarship. Faculty need their university's endorsement and their university's commitment to change tenure and promotion guidelines in ways that encourage and embrace new forms of scholarship. Ditto for university presses in terms of peer review and their support for interactive digital publications. Most new forms of scholarship have remained as secondary members in the formal knowledge chain. These objects have been largely confined to citations in journal articles and monographs, or cast onto accompanying websites, or the occasional peer-reviewed website especially in the sciences. Both the processes before publication and the activities that occur after publication are gradually gaining recognition as potential first-order elements of scholarship. The scholarly record is evolving from static to dynamic objects, from singular to compound properties, from a discrete time of publication to continuous release and revision, involving both formal and informal methods of dissemination and review, and a combination of academic and non-academic audiences. While these emerging character characteristics represent our current understanding of what top-notch scholarship could be, we still have a long road ahead, particularly in the humanistic fields, where traditional modes of scholarship have been slow to change. So tell me, what does it take to get a book if you're a humanities, oh, I said the word, what does it take to get tenure if you're a humanities scholar? Definitely a book. As the volume of scholarship multiplies on the web, 
and as the digital sophistication and appetite of our youth is encouraged and refined from birth through high school and onward, the structures and very futures of universities and their libraries are at risk if we are unable or unwilling to engage with innovative forms of teaching and research and to establish new ways of supporting, validating, and disseminating the best of this scholarship. Brown University recently received a grant from the Mellon Foundation to support its faculty in developing first-class digital publications. This initiative establishes a new collaboration between the university library and the office of the dean of the faculty as we jointly bring together key technological, organizational, and academic partners across the campus to generate a broader, more effective infrastructure to support long-form digital monographs in the humanities. This initiative will renew the traditional role for the university to to promote the scholarship of its faculty and will renew the library's role as a center for developing scholarship. With Mellon's support, Brown will build and test a prototype infrastructure for digital publications that includes editorial and specialized design assistance, dissemination and preservation services, and new systems of internal peer review and scholarly validation for these works. The library will build on its well-established Center for Digital Scholarship by adding a digital scholarly editor and an information designer to further guide and facilitate the development of high-quality digital publications. Our intention is not to become a press, but to work with university presses and other publication organizations to produce and disseminate these works. At the same time, the initiative will catalyze new systems of peer review, both within the university and the presses, to further legitimize born digital scholarly publications. So, you might ask, what's new? Well, what's new is that this time, it might actually work. This time, the donkey might get the cart to the market. Mellon has undertaken a multi-pronged plan to assist with the evolution of academic publishing in the digital age. Here's a list of just a few of the projects that Mellon has recently funded, with more in the pipeline. In understanding these and undertaking these projects, Grant recipients will be working within and across their institutions, collaborating with administrators, faculty, libraries, and presses. As we begin this initiative at Brown, one of our first tasks is to understand what characteristics might constitute a successful long-form digital monograph. Foremost among the expected characteristics is the presence of challenging research questions developed through critical analysis and interpretation, embodied in compelling narrative and revealed or enhanced through innovative uses of digital media and data. Authors will have the opportunity to incorporate more primary source material than was possible in the past and to build arguments that draw on a deeper and broader range of resources as they encourage their audiences to evaluate and interact with this evidence, they will need to discover how to transition persuasively between long-form narration and the presentation of compelling evidence that is increasingly multimedia, multidimensional, and multilayered. The Monarch Project at Brown is a study of medieval monasticism that describes the interrelationships among archeological, textual, and historical evidence comprised of excavation data, manuscripts, and architectural renderings, along with related visualizations and reconstructions. All of these data and their complex relationships are essential to understanding how monasteries functioned within their historical and physical context, and the narrative remains the critical element that explicates and interweaves this evidence. 
Today's capacity for real-time communication, connecting people and events around the world pr prompts an immediacy in scholarship that previously did not exist. This immediacy causes us to rethink the relationship between author and audiences. Many digital works now provide participatory elements, such as permitting readers to annotate the text, interact with the data, or find new paths through the narrative. Hypercities from Harvard's Meta Lab is both a book and an online project designed to show the exploration of mapping cities over time. The project reveals the historical layers of city spaces in an interactive hypermedia environment, which incorporates social media mapping, data visualizations, photographic documents, and Twitter streams. This interaction heightens the sense of being present and of creating a personal experience. Another relevant example is Neatline from the Scholars Lab at UVA. Neatline provides a platform for storytelling using maps, timelines, narratives, and digital objects. In order for the new form monographs to be successful, we must also rethink the format for distribution. Despite all the advances in digital devices and graphics, it is still difficult to read traditional long-form prose on a screen, a question that was raised earlier. Digital publications need new designs and structures, a new look and field, perhaps inspired by recent innovations in popular magazines and newspapers. The New York Times, for example, recently published, has recently published experimental long-form works that reimagine how complex, data-heavy information is presented to readers on a variety of devices. Their 2012 piece entitled Snowfall demonstrates a distinctly digital design sensibility delivered in an interactive format that accommodates everything from large screen displays to tiny mobile devices. Another consideration is whether these works will have permeable boundaries. Will they become dynamic pieces, deliberately left open-ended and available for amendments or enhancements? Archiving will serve as an important tool to support these works, including the ability of scholars to cite regularly updated content, as seen with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which provides a style manual for citing archived versions of different entries. We also ask, what will be the role of the scholar in creating these digital monographs? Whereas monographs have traditionally been the work of a solitary scholar, there is no question that these new works will require a collaborative team approach involving researchers, librarians, technologists, editors, and designers to deliver the final products. Although traditional publication has always relied on the contributions of editorial and design experts, especially toward the end of the process, we anticipate that these new works will demand full-on engagement early and potentially throughout their development. Collective action and commitment are necessary for success as we move from project to program, to publication. Together, libraries and their universities have the opportunity to mobilize action across our individual campuses, across the academy, and across scholarly communications. Yes, we are but two of the many forces needed to create change, but this is a time for action. We are called on to know to demonstrate and to tell our truth. Our truth is knowledge and our commitment is today. Thank you. Harriet, Harriet will take questions.
Hi, um, I'm Sarah Holder. I'm a librarian here at McGill. Um, earlier in your talk, you mentioned various relationships from the predatory and commercial models. How do you see um, traditional publishers um, in this mix? Are they going to be a partner, or is it going to be an adversarial re relationship um, with these new digital scholarly models? I think we can't uh, do the work unless it is through partnership. Uh, we've had the opportunity to talk to a few university presses. We're actually now beginning to talk to some commercial presses as well. And um, the interest on both sides is how can we work together to make this successful. And uh, there are certain things that uh, presses do very well, uh, revision, um, editorial guidance, uh, marketing, um, and there may be some things that libraries or uh, home institutions uh, may uh, provide in this process. And I think that is probably the development and potentially the hosting, uh, at least early on, of the digital object itself. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon Burr. I'm an archivist in the Big Library System. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, I know information literacy is part and parcel of what you're about here, but I'm just going to ask about the poor cousin of information literacy, archival literacy. Do you have such programs at Brown? Uh, is, this, is this something that, and I also noticed you said archiving some material there, which got my ears up. So I'm wondering how you're going about going to make sure, I guess through digital curation, that these things are kept forever, and there's a plan in place, and things like that. I just want more information. Well, I think this is uh, one of the questions of publication and who owns ultimately the responsibility. I think it uh, might vary uh, mm. in different environments, but uh, you notice that one of the slides that I uh, showed was the Stanford Encyclopedia of, mm. of Philosophy. So it's not only the question of um, being able to reference or, or archive, uh, variations on that text, but the text itself. And all of us, um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, we've got this covered. I actually don't think we do. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about it a lot, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, we, we don't have it covered. There's still so much to learn and, and to do. And uh, again, I think working with commercial entities, whether they happen to be publishers or something else, um, you know, a shared approach of, of understanding uh, the real issues and uh, the solutions would, would be great. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Eve Winter, a faculty member in political science. Sometimes when I hear these very optimistic and uh, um, technologically determinist talks um, that you know present this glorification of, of, uh, of technology and um, uh, note how um, humanities and social science research is slow to change, um, I find myself suddenly um, wondering whether I have um, prematurely aged and that I now uh, find myself in this um, position of the, uh, the old person in the room who um, just asks, um, maybe not so fast, maybe, um, maybe scholarship needn't uh, change so quickly, maybe um, the fact that we haven't learned how to read, um, write, and think in a digital age, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe um, there is something to hold on to learning how to uh, read books, working with text and with um, long form uh, narrative and so on. So I just wonder, um, you know, obviously there, um, there are many uses and um, avenues um, which you have shown where, um, you know, mapping and um, archaeology and architecture and so on um, that take, uh, make good use of such technologies. But uh, I I'm, I'm just want to push back against this idea that scholarship needs to change, is slow to change, and will inevitably change. I just, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't see it uh, across the board. And I think there needs to be space um, for kinds of scholarship and support from the library um, for uh, old school uh, uses of um, you know, pen, paper, and books. Thank you. Right. So you are definitely among friends. Um, I think everybody in this room would agree with you on many of the points that you made. The, one, um, the reason I give such talks is because I think 
not enough is talked about uh, on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and one of the reasons I feel that this is so important is what's happening in the world around us. So within the academy, the traditional style of scholarship, especially in the humanities, is accepted. We live in a hybrid world, as was uh, mentioned earlier. We will continue to live in this hybrid environment. But the students who are coming to us have not uh, perhaps lived in the same half of that hybrid uh, as many of us have. So I think how we prepare ourselves, both as educators, as librarians, uh, as facilitators for creating new knowledge, we need to be prepared to um, understand and to be, help our students connect with both sides of this equation. So I completely appreciate and understand what you're saying. One of the um, examples that I did include was a scholar at University of Chicago. I hope you recognize that that was without, uh, it, there might have even been a pencil there. Uh, <laughs> but we do understand and I think uh, most everybody in this room would um, applaud what you're saying as well as hopefully have some um, openness to uh, where we're headed, uh, because I do think we're headed there. Your question is probably related to his. Go for it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I feel a little bit like a Chinese intellectual being sent down to the countryside for digital retraining. Um, <laughs> So I'm a historian at Elizabeth Owen and a former editor of a journal where we've had a lot of discussions about open access and the digital revolution has had a significant impact. I had um, maybe two areas of concern to follow up on Eve's question. And the first is actually about funding and the implicit power dynamics that come out of the funding models. And my second concern is about the kind of teleological language of um, a digital modernity that will sweep away traditional modes of scholarship. My first question is actually about funding. It seemed to me one of the very significant things in your presentation was $3.1 million from Mellon um, to enable publishing to happen, which mirrors the fact that in our current environment, you know, we're, we're removing the capacity for a multitude of small journals to, I think, uh, gain income. And we're taking, you know, there, are, there are funding streams that are vanishing. So it's logical, therefore, that the impetus switches to large funding bodies and, in fact, to elite universities. And we look at my own journal, it went to a large elite university that was able to provide the internal funds because there's no funding model left to pay for peer review and editorial assistance. I'm concerned about the implicit language of you know, a spread of information that in some ways actually is, is creating it, implicit power dynamics that actually shift power to granting agencies, because if you have to publish everything with Shirt for open access, that means Shirt gets to decide what gets published, in a sense, and um, the implicit switch to larger elite universities. So that's just an issue um, that I don't have anything to know how to do with, but it seems to me that we need to think more about power and more about money when discussing these things, and that might lead us to temper some of this optimism. Uh, and my second concern is about the notion of this implicit modernity that is sweeping us away into a digital future that our young people are part of and we are not. Um, and of course, in part, that's true. But, and, and I wouldn't for a moment want to speak against the huge advantages and excitement of digital activity. But I also think that it's important not to have form drive content I'm concerned by the language of the librarians will participate in the research. No, the librarians should not actually be participating in the research, nor should the designers be participating in the research. And I think young people would actually hold on to that model. My experience is young people want to absorb dense, difficult texts. They don't need to be pandered to. I'm, so I'm, I'm sorry if that sounds a little rude. I, I didn't mean to put it quite like that. It came out the wrong way. Um, but I am concerned that we retain respect for scholarship and for the book length monograph is there for a reason. Finished books are there for a reason. Um, designers are not involved for a reason. So I, I, I think we need to hang on to that and I, I, I really do not think that young people should be used as a kind of image of a future that we should somehow abandon um, because we're 
um, aged and irrelevant. And I hope that didn't sound too rude. I, I was maybe putting it a little too bluntly. <laughs> That's... Not at all. I come from the same tradition, and I appreciate your comments. So really quickly, um, I want to. I'm going to start from an assumption that we're working to get the digital forms of scholarship that you were talking about on equal footing with more traditional forms. I understand that we've gotten a little bit of pushback in that in the last couple of minutes, but I am acknowledging that I realize that. But anyways, let's assume for a moment that the goal is equality. It seems to me that we in the academy own these processes. These are our processes. The fact that a book is required for tenure in the humanities, the fact that publishing agreements work a certain way. These are because these are the way we've designed these systems and these are the way we've participated in these systems. So if we want things to change, we then have the agency to change them. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how we as faculty or we as libraries might act on that agency, how we might continue to make this happen. So in some ways I feel, uh, or at least I had hoped that that would be the essence of my talk, but I'll, I'll uh, recount uh, just a bit. Uh, I think that the questions that are being faced are indeed not so much about form, uh, though form does uh, come into play, but about the criticality of the scholarship itself, the value of the scholarship to the discipline. Does it uh, take the discipline further than it is today? Um, in my view, it's impossible to ignore the digital trends that surround us. Um, and whether we wholesale uh, accept all of these and try to uh, have a checklist uh, and this is what has to happen in order for the next form of, of scholarly communication to evolve, I think that's actually not true. And what we have seen over time is a, a gradual approach. And the unfortunate thing, and I will speak uh, to this in terms of faculty at Brown, where I've worked for about 10 years, is that many um, elements of scholarship are bound up in their digital project, projects, which have remained projects. They have remained outside the scholarly record. Uh, they are considered second-class citizens. And I actually don't believe that at all. I believe the content itself is quite scholarly. And so the question is, how do we um, engage the processes by which we evaluate and authenticate scholarship, not, not technology or digital methods or effects, but the scholarship itself? Uh, and I do believe that that is a process that will take a long time, that the traditional monograph will probably continue, but I'm hoping, and I, I think we see evidence of gradual changes. Um, so. Thank you so much, it was great.